Ask yourself in this only every moment, do I feel good right now? Is there anything I can do different in routine to elicit greater pleasure, increasing happiness, joy, love for self and others? What in life causes me stress, pain, suffering, and how can I transform that energy into positivity? Our intent defines attraction. We must eliminate as much as possible the chaos, hate, anger, karma, pain, unless desiring such experience and outcome. Heaven or hell is just a matter of changing pattern. I prefer to create moment that feels good. Centering self for higher purpose and higher goal. Doing what feels beautiful we can allow ourselves experience of pleasure, health, well-being, joy, happiness, miracle, empathy and compassion for people, plants, animals, earth, and the whole universe. My life mantra, be here now. Reflecting inner witness. Christ said, the kingdom is within. Sanctuary is holding life as prayer. Church connecting to divinity while respecting all things as sacred and worthy of being. The law of energetic attraction surpasses the extent of reason. There is so much more to living than culture, society as divine by PhD degrees, education, peers and pulpit. Science cannot explain away mystery. We must Analyze interaction with all energies, not just human relations. There are they that hold key to further evolving insight. When the student is ready, it is said that the teacher will appear. Unfolding is never guaranteed, though the screenplay can channel direction. Live for purpose, love, compassion, empathy, charity, overruling other people's expectations for who we are and who we should be. Now is all that exists. We must become keenly aware of directing moment. We're responsible for the setup, calling, intent, attraction, and probability. A moment prepared in foresight can chance an experience intended. We must be the creator of the movie that is our lives. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is FallenAngels.tv, and it's a Saturday broadcast. Um, that's a poem from my third book, A Different Way of Being. And um, I appreciate the feedback. A, a, a lot of people do tell me that um you know you appreciate the the poems that I do share I had thought that I would you know cut that part of the show out but 
Um, it seems that, you know, those pieces of prose are able to give insight um, which otherwise, otherwise might not be understood. And in reflecting on those things and the, the poetry that I share, it helps to emphasize often a lot of things that I would be covering within the show. And so, thanks for joining me this uh, this evening. And I just want to, you know, tell all of you that um, I really appreciate you. And, uh, Tony, know that I did receive your email and that I'll be responding very soon. I've just been very busy with all the things that I'm doing. I, I am decided um i had been working on a a book the on the end of days and the and the destroyer and so i decided actually to merge that with the outline and the 38 pages of notes that i put together for what would be the the series that i did on the prophecy club uh which has its focus on you know, Lucifer being the father of Cain. Uh, but initially when Stan Johnson asked me to join him for a show, he queried me on what I thought was the most relevant aspects of the work that I do. And so I began an outline where I would just placing source material, which would reflect what I thought are the greater mysteries and the things that Christ spoke of as being hidden since the foundations of the world. And if I were to only have one shot, one chance, one opportunity to join him and to reach his listening audience, and also to, because he you know, was not wholly familiar with um, the amount and the things that I cover in my radio, video, and uh, book work. Um, and so I thought about that for a while and, and tried to narrow somewhat the focus of what it is that I cover and the topics and issues that I speak on and how I would want to present that to a new listener or to someone that's never heard of me and never heard any aspect of the work that I do. And so um, in putting together that outline, it covers in fullness all the things that I write about um, in all of my work. And even uh, you know the lot of poems that I've written, which are also complementary to the things that I've written about, as far as pre-existence, predestination, our focus, the way energy works, and uh, how it is that we are responsible for our realities, all those, all those kind of things, and and so I decided to actually present this outline which has a focus on the war in heaven, together with this book on the destroyer and the last days. And I'm thinking that together it will absolutely make uh, another sizable, um, what would be manuscript. Uh, I'm, I know that it's going to surpass 300 plus pages and so that's where the, my focus is going to be and I'm hoping m my hope is to be done with it by spring and to release it by summer and so this winter I will be working diligently on that manuscript and tidying it up and trying to um, strengthen it and also to, because 
I'm going to include, of course, the source material and a lot of things. That, of course, this book will, because it is a, a, a full merger of all of the, some of the topics and some of the things that I've covered in my other books, it will be more like all three more concise uh, without there being any kind of repeat and um, all contained with one. So it will be more like a, a best of almost kind of, um, but, you know, uh, the focus will be on presenting new information that even so that the book would stand on its own and so that, if somebody picked it up and had never heard about any of my other work or had never heard any of my radio shows or had ever read any of the previous books, that it would absolutely stand on its own and present um, a story and information which would not be dependent on any of the other texts and that it would also help the the seeker that has an interest on any of these topics to understand them all together in complexity so that the underlying truth that is found within all of the ancient mysteries the history Biblical prophecy, uh, the geological, archaeological record, uh, and even the anomalous, you know, like the Atlantis and the prior times, the uh, structures on the moon and Mars, and the presence of the feathered serpent, the Anunnaki, or, you know, even the Nephilim and the giants, all that will be included. Um, but it's going to tie together with the last days and the the destroyer um and and so it will cover you know from the beginning to the end which a lot of my books have that that similar kind of focus um but you know this book will will be different and so that what I'm going to be working on and endeavoring to complete by spring, uh, God willing, uh, I will be able to do that and get it out to you as soon as possible. Um, today, I'm going to I'm going to read what was the focus was on the voice of God in the last show. And I brought a lot of new information. Um, I, I had covered this material once before, but it was years ago and before many of you had had chance to to hear it. And also, it's you know lost in the archives because a lot of listeners, especially new listeners, uh, they will listen to the archives, but often individuals won't go back to like the very beginning and you know they'll miss out on the first couple of years and I did cover a lot of material during that time as well and but and so I thought that the message of the voice of God is very inspiring and also concise in that it tells you what the Most High, the creator of us all, has as far as expectations for how we are to serve him and also how we are to be in being good Bereans, good followers, good Christians, good um, good, you know, sons prodigal sons and coming back, returning to the to the Father, uh, sons of God, how we are to be in this lifetime, the things that we should focus on. And, you know, there have been other passages, like namely in the Old Testament, where um, 
Yahweh Elohim tells us in in certain passages, certain scriptures, how he does not want us, you know, to... It's not just about ritual. It's not just about um, mindlessly performing, you know, slaughtering bulls and offering up of certain animals and blood sacrifice. Um, that there's so much more to being good Christian and good followers of Christ in the example that he presents for us while embodied in flesh form and that and you know of course the commandments when like when somebody asked uh, Christ about inheriting the kingdom and and how he told us to um, follow the commandments uh, and that a large part of the law is having charity and, and being compassionate and acting through love um, so that, you know, you treat others as you would want them to treat you and that the commandments are set up in a dharmic kind of way so that if we do follow them, that according to the law of attraction and the way that energy and magic if you know if you want to call it magic cuz um the way energy and the law of attraction works is magical uh, um that we reap what we sow and that it becomes magnified and so if you do evil and random acts of kindness and uh you are good for goodness sake without expectation or reward or need to you know, for a benefit that just simply holding such space in 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 reflecting um, a Holy Spirit kind of way that you will attract goodness to yourself, and that that's simply the way it is, and that the opposite also holds true that if you are negative in your demeanor, that you are carnal in your um, in your focus that you will also be rewarded if you can call it that because you know being rewarded with evil or attracting evil and having evil compounded and coming back on you it doesn't seem like a reward but that is the way that it is that if you do evil, you have evil come back upon you, and so, um, so in reading and going into what will be the other aspect, the other part of the text, because I was not able to complete it, I think it will you will see, um, kind of the profoundness of this particular text and also it gives us guidance and true direction if we were to be able to ask God well what would you want of us what well, how do you want us to be how do you want us to to treat ourselves and others and you know the rest of creation because uh, we're to hold all things as sacred and to treat them as such and in doing so, the the blessings really pour out upon you. And that's the way that dharma and karma work. Dharma being um, the attraction of goodness, and karma being the attraction of the negative. Because in doing goodness, you will attract dharma and doing evil or negative you will attract karma and that's just the way that energy works and so we're going to go ahead and go into the text I know that I read a couple of the passages from this page that I ended on 
but not being sure exactly what was my stopping point, I'll go back and read just a a little bit of it and so that, you know, a couple paragraphs might overlap, but I think all of this is so meaningful and so beneficial for those of you that are are really interested in this in this text um that I, I don't think it's gonna harm you in any way to ref, reflect a little bit on something that we covered previously. And also if you have any questions, uh please place them in the chat room. Uh, also I wouldn't to let you know that I was gonna do a, a show on the Book of Secrets next week, but I have been asked questions on and this is perplexing for a lot of people on how it was that the the Nephilim being the fallen angels, I know a lot of people equate the Nephilim with the giants, but it's my opinion that the Nephilim are actually the fallen angels and that the giants are those that are born from them and also how the serpent seed or the seed of Cain found continuance through the flood and survived the judgment of it. And so next week I will um, redo a show because I covered this on Revolution Radio about a month or two months back. Um, but because the archives have been deleted by YouTube and that um, many of my personal shows as well as all the other hosts, like I I think I lost 17 shows, one of them being that one on the the you know the continuance of the seed of the serpent and the giants and the fallen angels through the flood um as well as others like the show that I did with Jonathan Gray and uh, other individuals and so I will do this one again next week and that this is also some information that is part of what was the re release of my fourth book, Lucifer, Father of Cain, that I added to and included uh, information that I will um, bring up on that show because my stance differed somewhat from what was the release of the first edition to that of the second edition. And that currently, right now, um, the second edition of my fourth book are only available through the Prophecy Club and that they are being released exclusively through them. But there will be a point, and it's probably just you know a month or two away, um, that I will release this also to the public. I just want them to have a chance to um, hold them and to release them exclusively to their listeners um and and that this is goes in tangent with the five part series that I did with the prophecy club on Lucifer father of Cain as topic and that I'm supposed to actually contact them sometime very soon to um speak about other topics and issues but for right now um in which I added about 40, almost 50 pages to that edition, and that there's a whole lot of new information that was not included with the first release. And so um, I, I believe it is worthy for those that have studied and that have read it previously to reread it Um and I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to get you to buy another copy. That's, you know, the money and all that is the furthest thing from my mind. So, anyways, we're going to continue with this information. And then if you have chat uh, questions, just post them in the chat room and I will get to them. All right. Now, if you're just joining us for this show and you didn't catch the 
the one previously, you will definitely want to hear last week's show uh, where I covered the first part of this text. And for those that don't know, this is the voice of God, which is chapter 15 of the Colbrim Bible, and that we will also probably going be going into chapter 16, which is the Spirit of God uh, from the Colbrim text. It says this, Men with sincere hearts seeking a path ask for a starting point. However, for most, the key is self-discipline, and this is the reason for many laws and restrictions, but these must never be unnecessarily restrictive. Each must have a definitive purpose and beneficial end. Obscure thought these may, obscure though these may be, the means for overcoming unwholesome desires and for harmonizing with the divine cord within the reach of all. But effort must be expended in their cultivation. If the end is great beyond man's conception, it is no less true that the task before man is arduous and difficult in the extreme. To master himself, and gain complete self-control is no more than the first step along the path. And though men may despair because I am veiled from them, though they may seek without finding, I am not indifferent to their needs and desires. Doubt and uncertainty are essential earthly conditions, serving a definite end. I have not surrounded men with perplexities and obscurities unnecessarily. The climate of unbelief and materialism, strange though it may seem to men, is best for their spiritual health. I know better than men themselves what is best for them, for I alone can see the broad design spread over the ages. I alone see the end and objective. Though unenlightened men expect it, it is not meet for me to interfere unduly in the affairs of the earth. All things are mine and under my dominion, but man may deal with them as he will. I do not interfere, but finally man is accountable. Though I have all and nothing can add to my grandeur, with all this I still labor. Therefore man should never disdain to labor, for this is an attribute of the highest. I do not require of any man that he do something that I would not do, or be something I would not be. I am the God of righteousness. If ever I ceased to labor, the universe would be without order. Chaos would prevail and precede its destruction. I am the God of many aspects. For men may conceive me in any form they wish, or even as something without form. I am the God of men's hearts. In whichever way and by whatever name men serve me, abiding by my laws and conforming with the great design is right in my eyes. Any path which will bring man to his goal is the right road. Truly the paths chosen by men are many and varied. Some are even devious. But if they be true paths of enlightenment and development, they are acceptable in my sight. However, those who lust for earthly power, offering sacrifice and worship to earthly gods, conceived to accord with their desires, are not acceptable to me. It is true 
that earthly success and power may come to those who strive for them, but do they achieve anything more than fleeting satisfaction? What manner of being would now dominate earth had all men been without divine enlightenment from the beginning? If earthly ends alone had dominated men's minds, consider what earthly life would have been like had it been left to develop predominated by materialism. If it had not what earthly life, if it had not been mitigated by injections of the divine. There are four main types of men who are good and serve me well. They are those who suffer courageously the afflictions and sorrows which develop the soul. Those who labor that earth and man may benefit. Those who seek after truth and those with vision and creativity. Yet how, how rare are those among these who do not besmirch, besmirch their record with deeds of evil and thoughts of wickedness? All too many ha may have, by their carnal desires and acts of wickedness, countered their goodness to the detriment of their immortal souls. If a man follows a false god with goodwill and honesty, serving men well and living in accordance with my laws, I will not repudiate him, and he will not be denied enlightenment on the way. There are many roads along which the soul may travel to bring about its development and awakening to self-consciousness, but it is not advantageous to choose, but is it not advantageous to choose the best one. Only the foolish travel blindly without seeking guidance and directions. Those who have little wisdom or who are easily misled follow roads which go nowhere. They who follow a barren faith reach a barren destination. They find only an empty place devoid of hope incapable of fulfilling their dreams and aspirations. Those who worship gods of their imagination, gods and strange likenesses which have been brought into being by man's creative conceptions, will go to these gods who have an existence in a dim shadow realm. Those who worship lower spirits will go to them and those who worship the demons of darkness will join them. For what a man desires, he deserves. There is a link between that which men desire and what becomes established in existence. Provision is made for man to receive the fruits of his own creations. I'm going to stop here for a second because... These last three sentences are verification and confirmation of what I was speaking about in the poem that I read um, previous to our going live. Because this is something that I learned a long time ago. This is one of those mysteries, one of those secrets that the Holy Spirit had blessed me to come to discernment upon that being how we are, what we focus on, what our intent is, what we project in our minds and hold as ideas, our ways of being, how we act in goodness or evil. Those things have authority and power in what is the manifestation of our realities and the things that we attract to ourselves. And so that's why a long time ago, and I've been trying to teach people that, you know, like individuals that speak about going to church or that 
practice meditation that church is not just a building. It's not just somewhere you go. And that meditation is not something that you do or prayer, something that you do. It's in truth something that we become. And that when you truly understand the underlying secrets of church and meditation and prayer, you understand that we are to, that these things are ways of being, that church is every moment, meditation every moment, prayer every moment, that it is recon, recognition that now is the only thing that ever exists and that our focus, if we are to try to create positivity and that if we are trying to manifest miracle and to create dreams, better better ourselves, that we must act within the moment because it's all that exists and that the moment is church that now is church, that we are to live prayer, to live meditation, and that these things are not just activities or things that we do, but things that we become. And so that's the real secret. And I know that a lot of people don't get this, that most of the world still gets caught up and lost in the past or the future. And that so much of what is the ongoing moment is missed and lost because of stress, because of focus on things that have happened in the past or things that are coming in the future. And that a lot of people absolutely live this way. They live in the past or in the future and completely miss what is going on in the moment now all the time. That they act like zombies and really are zombies because they have no connection to moment. They have no connection to the only thing that is real and the only thing that truly exists and that is happening all the time. Because the now is the only thing that is happening. All right. I hope that makes sense to you and that it's not just, you know, just over your head um, because I try to explain in such a way that you can embrace this and try to try to um, implement this these teachings and this knowledge into your own life so that you can utilize the moment in in such capacity to create beauty for yourself. And I you know, I've spoken to some individuals as of late that have been living or or just kind kind of surviving in misery and are recreating every day the same kind of routine with their self and with loved ones and that they are finding no joy, no happiness from their daily lives. And I try to tell them and try to emphasize that often it takes more energy to continue to create life in such such harmful ways and in such stress 
uh, and that the stress and the the misery and the um, the the um, anger, hate, resentment, the pain, the suffering that a lot of times these things are taxing the mind, the body, spirit, um, the emotion, the mental, are are taxing you in ways that if you could utilize the day and the new opportunity of every moment to change your routine, to project energy that would attract a different outcome that it would be greatly more beneficial to you and that it would start the the change and that it would start the uh, you know the attraction of new outcome and new reality and that you know we have to take little steps in order to bring big things into focus and into manifestation and that a series of you know of these little things all brought together can add up to certain dreams or certain goals and then that's the way of it that's that's how we do things. That's how it is done. And so, all right, I'm going to continue now. I'm going to read those three sentences real quick again. Um, Those who worship gods of their imagination, gods and strange likenesses which have been brought into being by man's creative conceptions, will go to these gods who have an existence in dim, shadowy realm. Those who worship lower spirits will go to them, and those who worship the demons of darkness will join them. For what a man desires, he deserves. There is a link between that which men desire and what becomes established in existence. Provision is made for man to receive the fruits of his own creations. Whatsoever you do, whatsoever you plan or create, whatsoever you suffer, let it be an offering unto me, not for my sake, but for yours. I am the God of compassion, the God of understanding. From those who in their devotion offer me but a single leaf, a flower or fruit, or even a little water, This I will gladly accept, thus lightening their loving spirit. For it is offered in in sincerity of heart. He who comes before any god whatsoever, its image with pureness of heart and good motives, comes unto me. For I gaze upon him with compassion and understanding. I am not concerned with the deeds alone of men. But with their motives, empty gestures are ignored. But that which is done with good intent and a loving heart never goes unheeded. I am the hidden God, hidden to serve an end, veiled in misery. I am further obscured by the mists of mortal delusion. Unable to see me, men declare I do not exist. Yet I declare to you that man with his mortal limitation sees only a minute part of the whole. Man is the slave of illusion and deception. Though man is born to delusion, for it is a needful state, he is further inflicted by deceptions wrought by men. Though man cannot perceive the greatness above him, Because of its greatness, neither can he see the smallness beneath him because of its smallness. From the greatest came the smallest, and from the smallest came creation. 
and within the smallest is greatness and power. For the smallest is far less than the moat, yet it is the upholder of the universe, and it shines like the sun beyond the darkness. It lies out towards the edges, the edge of the reach of man's thought. In the beginning, all things arose from the invisible, and into the invisible all things will disappear in the end. But the end is not the end of the spirit. Out beyond this material creation born of the invisible, there is a higher eternal invisible of greater substance. When all material things have passed away, this will remain. Above all is timelessness, which is eternity, and there is my abode. The supreme goal of man and those who attain it dwell in eternity. I am the eternal God. Few are they who can conceive of me as I really am. The unborn and the uncreated, beginningless and without end. Lord of all the spheres, those few who can conceive of me as I am are awakened spirits, freed from mortal delusions. As thick clouds of smoke rise up and spread out from a fire burning in damp wood, so did the material universe come forth from me. As a lump of salt dropped into a pool of water, dissolves and cannot be removed afterwards, yet from whatever part of the water you draw, there is salt. So it is with my pervading spirit. I am the great luminary, the everlasting source of light, sparks which imprisoned in matter becomes the slumbering souls of men. I'm going to read that last sentence again. I think that is uh, profound. I am the great luminary, the everlasting source of light sparks, which imprisoned in matter becomes the slumbering souls of men. These unconsciously guided spread out the five senses under the control of unconscious thought. That which the senses harvest departs with the spirit. It is borne away the, by the spirit, even as perfume is carried by the wind. I am the boundless one, the one beyond limitations. I remain free and unencumbered by the effort of creation. I am, and I watch life unfold. I set the course which nature follows to bring forth all that lives. The fools on earth who shut their eyes and complain because they stumble, the ignorant who choose to walk in darkness, and the apathetic who choose paths of ease and comfort have no knowledge of me. Their hopes are sterile. Theirs the choice of darkness. Theirs the choice of ignorance. Theirs the choice of the apathetic inertia. Their learning is futile. Their thoughts fruitless and their deeds without purpose. Though man is born in ignorance and darkness, he is also heir to the guiding light which dispels them. The light is his for the taking. Then there are the awakened souls among men. Their sustenance is my own nature. They know my spirit is among men as an everlasting source of strength and refreshment to the weary and disheartened. They are in harmony with my spirit and therefore know me. Men call me the god of battles, which I am not. For good men fight each other when kings declare war. Men call me many things, but this does not make me become what they think I am. 
I am the hidden power which ultimately rights all wrongs, which will eventually redress all injustice. I come to all who are worthy, but it is the lonely, the unwanted, the undesirable whom I seek. I need the dispirited, the perplexed, the sorrowful and humiliated soul is an irresistible magnet. I am the light at the end of the road, the companion who walks in compassionate silence, the understanding friend, the ever-ready arm. I am he who presides over the haven of peace within your heart. A couple more paragraphs and then I'll check the chat room. To those who unite their spirit with mine and to those who are in harmony but not united, I increase that which they have and provide what they lack. I turn a like countenance to all men. My love for them remains constant. But those who join me in devotion to my cause are truly in me and I am in them. This is my everlasting and unchanging promise unto me. He who walks with me, serving my cause, shall not perish. So join your spirit with mine, giving me your confidence and trust, and thus united in a harmonious relationship, you will come to know the supreme goal. Men say they cannot know me through their senses, and this is true, for I am above and beyond the reach of their finite senses. The senses of man are not meant to be the means for experiencing me. They are for experiencing the material sphere. They are also limiting, shutting out far more than they reveal. Yet men have within men a greater sense which can know me, but it lies dormant in the mass of men. I am the light within the heart, the consciousness of all living things. I am the God of consciousness, the listener in the silence. All right, I want to make a comment here. Um... I have talked about how dreaming dreaming is also verification that we are not wholly just our bodies that the bodies are just our flesh containers and that it is armor of soul, armor of spirit, that what we utilize as vehicle for going through lifetime and this particular third dimensional world that if you think about dreaming and how it is that the consciousness is able to move from that of wearing the flesh and working through and utilizing the flesh to navigate and to be part of this, what we call the waking dream or true reality that in dreaming, when we are asleep and our spirits are released from our flesh and our bodies and the the prison of the waking dream, that in our spirits we go into the, our dreaming bodies, 
and that our spirits are released to be able to be in a whole different realm, a whole new arena of experience. And that in that arena, in that realm, we are not limited by the physical laws of this third dimensional way of being of the waking dream and of the the gravity and uh, the energetic laws, the way things that work while we are in our flesh bodies. That in our dreaming bodies, you can fly, you can go through walls, you can do all kinds of interesting things. And that that realm, that world, has greater possibility. That you're even able to see future and past events, um, things that will be or are considered prophetic that have not happened yet and that are linked to something that is beyond, that surpasses the the linear movement of, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, spring, summer, fall, winter, night, followed by day, that there's no limitations and that the the space of dreaming is beyond time and beyond experience. And that those that learn how to become lucid dreamers and to learn how to access such space and to, um, to utilize tapping into the divine, that like Daniel, he could receive message and that he learned to interpret um, things that were going to happen, things that would occur in the future. And that the Most High worked with him in that realm and through that medium of dreams to show his spirit things that would occur even thousands of years into the future with the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, um, the statue, you know, the gold, silver, iron, clay. And so anyways, uh, dreaming is just further confirmation that our spirits, that aspect of ourselves that is connecting link to the Creator, to the Most High, that part of us that is the Christ consciousness, the kingdom within, that part of us, our spiritual beings, have so much more capacity and ability and that we do not even understand barely tap into the limitless reaches of our spiritual nature. And that's the part of us that is immortal. That's the part of us that will survive our bodies and that will go on forever. And that's the part of us that has chance for salvation and an eternal inheritance which includes infinity, eternity, forever. All right, continuing. I do not manifest to man through his, Im- his mortal senses. For these are bounded by earthly limitations. I want to make sure I didn't read this. 
Okay, yeah, I don't think so. I do not manifest to man through his mortal senses, for these are bounded by earthly limitations. I manifest through the great sense which is of the spirit, the sense of the soul. As pure light hides many colors, so am I hidden in the hearts of men. As sparks fly from a bellows blown fire, so from the eternal fire the life sparks fly out to glow for an instant in matter and then fall back. As the sun radiates heat, a flower perfume in a lamp light, so does the heart of man create his own spiritual state. The eye of man sees a pebble, a star, a sheep, or a tree, and these do not appear to him in any way alike. Yet all are differing forms manifesting in the one outflowing force originating with me. This outflowing force generated mat, which gave birth to substance, and endowed it with the matrix for form. I think that word was supposed to be matter. This outflowing force generated matter, which gave birth to substance and endowed it with it with the matrix of form. The fragments of divine spirit interpret that which the divine spirit created, but they cannot know it it, it in its reality. For enshrouded in matter, they sleep. Because the material sphere is a separate part of the greater whole, the mortal part of man can never hope to know in full its boundless beauty or experience its limitless bliss. Out beyond the limits of man's thought and conception, beyond reach of even the most vivid imagination. The wonder and glory of all, of it all stretch out into absolute perfection. Even all the outer reaches where eternity begins, the wonder of the inner glory remains veiled. No words of man can ever hope to describe the true man the true nature of divine things. To the divine alone can the divine be known. The radiant living heart pulsating with love can never be known to man as man. But when man becomes more than man, he may take his first glimpse behind the veil. I am the inspiration and the goal of man. Before creation, I was the one alone. I thought, and the thought became a command of power, and into the void of the invisible came that which was the potential of substance. Though itself then part of the invisible, light was born of the power and my spirit was in the midst of the light. But it was not that light which lightens the day. A firmament became the foundation of all things, matter gradually forming there, becoming ever denser as it thrust outward from the invisible. It moved from a subtle state to something more solid, from intangibility to substance from incoherent substance into a state of density and form I commanded the subtle substance with light but without form to mate with the subtle substance of darkness and became dense it did so and became water then I spread water over the darkness below the light, placing a foundation of light above the waters. This brought forth 
the light of mortal vision, which is not the light of the Spirit, nor the light of power. At that time, the universe was made and the earth received her form. It slept warmly in the midst of the waters, which were not the waters of earth, and this was before the beginning of life in earthly substance. I am the God of creation. Okay, I want to stop here for just a second as well. Because for those of you that are familiar with my work, that have studied um, either of my fourth book, Lucifer, Father of Cain, or my sixth book, Sons of God, Who We Are and Why We're Here, uh, in those two books, I begin with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then I describe and explain how the rest of creation, in, including us, as the sons of God, how everything came into being and that really the entire universe was sang into being by the Word, who is the visible embodiment of the invisible creator. And I talked about how it was that Christ was introduced to the sons of God and also to the creation as the light of the universe, as the light that brought all other things into visibility. And that when the sons of God saw the light and heard the voice of the Most High, the Creator, the Father of us all, call for the light, call forth the Son, saying, let there be light, and that Christ came forth as that light, and in coming forth, all of creation became visible. It says in the book of the bee that the sons of God knew immediately that the light was the Son, the only begotten of the Father, the Most High, and that the Father and the Son were one, that together with the Holy Spirit they make up the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, and that the voice that had called forth the light was the Creator, the Father of us all. And though you do not remember, though that memory has been stricken from our memory, it is emblazoned, it is burnt into the knowledge of our spirit. And there will be a day when we will recall all things, including the moment that Christ was introduced to us all. And that moment that he took dominion, and it is also the same moment which drove Lucifer to anger and jealousy. It's the moment that iniquity was found within him. All right. And so, before creation, I was the one alone, the Most High. Uh, the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I thought and the thought became a command of power. That's the word, you know, and the outward expression of intent, manifesting, creating. Uh, and then, you know, talking about how, um, well, I'll just read those two sentences again. And into the void of the invisible came that which was the potential of substance. Though itself then part of the invisible, light was born of the power, and my spirit was in the midst of the light. But it was not that light which lightened the day. All of this is what I talk about in the first two chapters of my fourth book as well as my sixth. 
and how I try to explain this same thing. At the foundations of my creations are tr at the foundations of my creations are truth and reality. These are with me and of me, but they are not my substance. Neither are they things comprehensible on earth. These are truly great things indescribable in the inadequate words of men, which can do no more than form an imperfect, incomplete, and distorted picture of them. Simple things can be described clearly in a few words to the understanding of man, but greater things become increasingly difficult to deal with through mere words. What words of man can be used to describe the indescribable? How can things beyond the comprehension of mortal men be brought within the limits of their understanding? Before the shadow, there was this reflecting light, a light so bright that were it not veiled in the darkness, it would consume the shadow. Seeking to explain and describe transcendent Transcendental things in the limited language of man only leads to obscurity and confusion. The words form incomprehensible sentences, and unthinking men will declare them to be incoherent. Therefore, look behind the sentences strung together with mere words. I am the unknown God veiled from man by man's mortal limitations. Gosh, I'm not even be able to finish all this. Um, maybe on the the show that I do on the Book of Secrets in two weeks, we'll finish up this text and then go into some of the others. The universe came into being and exists because I am. It is my reflection in matter. As a man remains unaffected by the manifestations of his shadow, so do I remain unaffected by the material creation. As heat comes forth from fire and contains its essence in nature, though it is not fire, neither has it the substance of fire, so does my creation relate to me. I am an object reflected in water, the water may not know the reflection or find it within itself, but this inability has no effect on the reality of the object, nor on the fact of its reflection. It is as a man looking into clear water on a calm day sees his reflection therein, but if the wind blows, the image becomes distorted, and if the sun hides its face, the image disappears. Yet none of these effects touches upon the image itself, nor upon that which casts the image. When the wind drops, the cloud vanishes and the sun reappears. Both distortions and deception end, and the reality is again reflected. Within my creation is my spirit, which supports it, and this spirit is the bond between my creation and myself. No man acknowledges the air because it is still. But when this same air becomes a whirlwind, men give it their whole attention. With me all is real, while with man all is illusion. But man may abandon his illusions in seeking me, and he will thereby discover reality. I am the reality behind the reflection. I am the uncaused cause. Those who turn away from the glorious jewel within to seek an outside God, a separate, unresponsive being, are looking for a mere trinket while disregarding the priceless treasure already in their keeping. Men of light worship the vision of light. Men of darkness and ignorance worship ghosts and dark spirits, demons of the night. There are few men who, moved by dark beliefs, 
or their carnal lusts and perverted passions, perform awful austerities and self-mutilations never ordained by me. They delight in tormenting the life and spirit within their bodies, torments, and so continue them, but these may be truly described as mutilated souls. Some men follow gods who punish wickedness and reward good, and therefore tend towards goodness. But it is not folly to follow non-existent gods. But is it not folly to follow non-existent gods? All men choose their own spiritual destiny, whether it be done knowingly or not. For under the law, their future state must rest in their own hands. I want to emphasize this sentence. Because, again, this is confirmation of the poem that I read at the beginning of the show. And if you're a latecomer to the show, please visit the archives and listen to that poem. Because it's relevant to what we are talking about. All men choose their own spiritual destiny whether it be done knowingly or not, meaning that the way that the law of energetics, the way magic, the way attraction works, that if you know about it and you are aware of it and you use your knowledge for to create and to manifest goodness, well, then you'll create a reality that reflects that goodness. But... If you do not know about the law of attraction and how magic and energy works, and you create in your ignorance, you oftentimes will manifest and create from your negativity. Because a lot of people that don't understand that we are responsible for the manifestation of reality and for attracting goodness uh, or dharma and karma, a lot of them love misery they engage in negativity and they act evilly towards others and they are deceitful in their ways of being they are they do not follow the commandments and they act contrary and because they act contrary they still attract negativity and you know lessons in in such ways. Anger, hate, pain, suffering. How they say misery loves company? Well, those who are and hold on to those ways of being and that are that way daily over and over again, they they wonder why their lives are such a mess, why nothing good can happen to them. And it's because whether it be done knowingly or not, for under the law, their future state must rest in their own hands. And so a lot of people are creating negative energy, sending it out into the world, and have it being compounded, and it comes back to them over and over every day. I am the God who ordained the law, and nothing man can do will change it. My love alone mitigates the consequences of man's unredeemed wickedness. So the law, this is what we're talking about. The law of attraction, the law of manifestation, the, the way that energy works, karma, dharma, all the same thing and again it has to do with that every moment is church that every now is prayer is meditation and how we are is what goes out into the world and compounded comes back to us as they said in the bible you reap what you sow I am the God who ordained the law and nothing man can do will change it. 
My love alone mitigates the consequences of man's unredeemed wickedness. I am the changeless, changeless one. Could a god of love become a god of vengeance? Revenge is something alien to me. Therefore, is it reasonable that man should believe I could be one thing today and then because they fall into error, become something else tomorrow? My nature is not as that of man. I am as I am. Last paragraph. I am not influenced by the mere formal actions of men or by empty sacrifice. Lighted lamps and candles, days of fasting and self-mortification by man cannot sway me in his favor. I am not to be bribed, for I am God. He who handles fire carelessly and gets burnt cannot blame the fire. Neither can he who goes into swift waters and drowns blame the waters. There are laws, the violations of which brings retribution in its train. They who by their own deeds bring pain and suffering upon themselves cannot blame me for what ensues. These are the effects of the lesser laws which are easily understood, but above these is the great law, which is not so incomprehensible. Under this, the link between the deed and its effect is not so apparent. Men bring down calamity and suffering upon their own heads and blame me when the fault lies with them and the cause is their own misconduct or misconception. Men reap as they sow, and I am the fertile field, which takes no part in the sowing or the reaping. Man is his own master and the lord of his own destiny. He cannot expect help from any great power unless he himself expend effort to contact such power or be deserving of help. Everything a man is or becomes is the result of his own striving and efforts or his lack of them. I made man to be a man, not a mere puppet or nursling. I am the God of the law. I am the God of the stalwart. Okay, just a couple of sentences I want to read again. And then I'll make final commentary. We'll end here, and then we'll pick this up in two weeks. Because, again, this is so very important. There are laws, the violation of which brings retribution in its train. They who by their own deeds bring pain and suffering upon themselves cannot blame me for what ensues. These are the effects of the lesser laws which are easily understood, but above these is the great law which is not so incomprehensible. Under this, the link between the deed and its effect is not so apparent. Men bring down calamity and suffering upon their own heads and blame me when the fault lies with them and the cause is their own misconduct or misconception. Men reap as they sow, and I am the fertile field, which takes no part in the sowing or the reaping. Man is his own master and the lord of his own destiny. He cannot expect help from any great power unless he himself expect expend effort to contact such power, or be deserving of help. Everything a man is or becomes is the result of his own striving and efforts, or his lack of them. I made man to be a man, not a mere puppet or nursling. I am the God of the law. I am the God of the stalwart.
All right, well, we're going to have to end it there. I hope that um, this makes sense to you, and I hope that you take what I'm trying to explain and trying to help you to understand into consideration and to embrace it so that you can create beauty in your life, that you can bring positivity back to if you are suffering or in pain or uh, engaged in misery. Know that we are responsible for the attraction of such things and take responsibility. Quit blaming others. Quit blaming everybody else. But hold yourself accountable and then holding yourself accountable, change it. Make things better. Create new realities. Manifest new dreams. God bless all. I'm not going to play a final song because we're at the end of the show. Um, but I will I will talk to you next week uh, on Wednesday. God bless all. Good night.